Spaced repetition learning has a great reputation for one simple reason. It's powerful. And it's powerful because it works. But here's the catch. You must use spaced repetition correctly for optimal results. And the good news is, is that it's easier than you think to master this game-changing approach to how you learn. And how to master it is exactly what you're going to learn in this video, including some cool ways that spaced repetition has appeared throughout history. And the best part is you can apply this scientifically validated technique to any subject and even most skills that you long to learn. And once you get it right, this memory technique will be your go-to learning tool for the rest of your life. I know it's certainly going to be mine for the rest of my life because I love using it. So are you ready? This is Dr. Anthony Metivier, your devoted cheerleader of all things related to helping you optimize your memory from MagneticMemoryMethod.com. This channel, my podcast, my website exists to support, inspire, and when needed, educate people in depth about how to experience truly magnetic levels of memory. What does that mean? It means exactly what magnets imply, attracting what you want to remember while repelling all of the distractions. But since memory improvement and most, if not all, learning involves you getting yourself to do what needs to be done based on detailed, in-depth exploration of what memory is and how it works, my special mission is exactly that, to help you attract the information that matters and nothing else while repelling everything that does not matter, which is the majority of the information out there. So if you're new here, you like nuance and detail that helps you take substantial action and get full and complete results, get subscribed. And for the love of memory and learning, as we enter part five of our series, The New Art of Memory, hit that thumbs up. Okay, so spaced repetition is essential to memory and it simply means repeatedly exposing yourself to information or ideally repeatedly producing information that you have exposed yourself to in the past. And you want to do this in ways that ideally avoid rote learning. Rote is the repetition of information without any kind of creative, shall we say, entanglement. And this is where a lot of people fall into traps. Rote is tedious, it's boring, and even though it can have an effect, it's not nearly as effective as what I call creative repetition. And scientists often call creative repetition active recall. And we'll get to that in a minute. To avoid rote is pretty simple though. You basically combine all the tools of the magnetic memory method on an optimized schedule that helps you avoid the forgetting curve. In other words, space in spaced repetition refers to the arrangement of time. But when we're using tools like the memory palace, we're also referring to the arrangement of information in space in terms of distributed throughout rooms, throughout journeys, in outdoor locations, and even theoretically, you can space the information throughout the books themselves if you use individual pages as memory palaces, which is part of the ne plus ultra of the magnetic memory method at large if you get really deep into it. Now, as a memory hack, this form of creative recall through spaced repetition is a very, very legitimate alternative to cramming, and it is definitely a beautiful alternative to exposing yourself to rote repetition through digital devices. Now, for those of us using memory techniques like memory palaces, we can integrate them with spaced repetition software if we want, but ideally what we want to be able to do is do space repetition purely in the mind of our own volition because that voluntary use of trying to use active recall to remember the information that we previously exposed ourselves to forms memories faster. Now, in the ancient times, people of course used memory palaces a lot and some of them even used devices called memory wheels. More on those in a bit. But for now, let's talk a little bit more about repetition itself. Because, you know, content may be king, but context is God. Now, scholars aren't entirely sure, but the ancient poet Horace may have been the first to identify this principle of repeating information when he reportedly said, repetition 
is the mother of learning. Here's the problem though. People don't like to repeat things over and over again. That's rote learning and it's not only boring and painful, rote learning is actually known to stunt critical thinking skills. Now the research is available on my blog and it's discussed in my full video on rote learning and you know, I go into why we should be avoiding rote learning like the plague. And the alternative is using creative repetition. So what is just a simple example of it, like of this creative repetition process and why it's not rote, even though I like to repeat things, that's why I memorize them in the first place. I was studying some Seneca in Latin, Seneca wrote uh, something to the effect of nihil minus est omnes occupati quam we weary. Now, basically what that means is that humans busy themselves with the busyness of life, the busy stuff. They don't actually busy themselves with the beautiful stuff of life. And when I repeat this, I am never repeating it in a rote manner. What I'm trying to do is use creative repetition by looking in the memory palace where I placed those Latin words and using the magnetic memory method, this is very, very simple and fast. So Nihil, I have a friend named Nick or Nikita. Can you remember the four words? Yeah, in which sequence? <laughs> in any sequence you want. Um, abuela, grandmother, abuelo, um, grandfather. Uh, a prayer uh, is open. Um, April is uh, April, and uh, Abajo is uh, under. What are we, like an hour and a half now from the last test? Or well, probably more than that. Actually, I think the video file will show us. Yeah, yeah. Very good. 100%. As far as I'm concerned. And I go into his place as a memory palace, and then I have him with a big calculator pressing the minus button. Nihil minus est. Now I won't go through the rest of that phrase, but when I revisit that, this is creative recall. I'm asking myself, what was it that Nick was doing there? Nick tells me that that phrase must start with N-I because I chose him. Nihil, Nikita, right? Then the next word is the thing he's doing, pressing the minus button. This is creative, active recall. It's forming memory so much faster. Now I could, either in spaced repetition or on an index card, have nihil minus est and just look at it again and again and again. But as we know, that creates problems for critical thinking skills. And of course it does. If you're sitting there repeating the same thing over and over and over and over without some sort of integration with it, some sort of elaboration of the information, you are doing yourself a disservice. You're not only slowing yourself down, you're not having fun. Now, frankly, the internet is like one big rote learning machine and you can spare yourself the dumbing down of your own mind. And you don't have to take my word for it. Look at the research I've presented, the research article by scientists who are showing this dumbing down, and just look around at the world. People are obviously exposing themselves, wrote, 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 wrote to the same messages, and their thinking skills are going down, 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 down. So your mission is to say yes to the great memory tradition and start to use creative repetition in the way that I have just suggested. And you know, memorizing some Seneca in Latin might do you some good so that when you're getting busy with the stuff of life, you're actually getting busy with the stuff of life that matters, which is part of the magnetic memory method message. Constantly memorize the information that matters, the information that reminds you to focus on what matters, such as this beautiful quote from Seneca. Now, when it comes to the technology, we don't necessarily want to throw the baby out with the bathwater because let's face it, a lot of technology is really cool. If you're using software like Anki, it is possible to use it in combination with proper active recall. But basically, you could save yourself the time. And one way that you can do it, if you're gonna do it, is draw your associations, take a photograph, pop them into Anki. But you can get similar and superior effects by doing it in your mind. And I personally avoid Anki because it lives inside of the ultimate distraction machine. It's either on a desktop computer or in a so-called smartphone. And I just want to limit my exposure to that stuff as much as possible in order to do it manually in a way that gives me more critical thinking, gives me more creative skills and experience, and I don't have to worry about whether it's gonna work or not, and I haven't relegated it to some algorithm. 
I am the algorithm, and I encourage you to make yourself the algorithm too. Okay, so if you're going to use cards, physical flashcards, which is not necessarily a bad idea when you're using memory techniques, you know, make sure that you also elaborate them. Make sure to use some colors, use some drawings in order to help yourself. And do not put the answer on the card. When I make my cards, the odd time that I do use cards, I don't have anything on the back of the cards because Active Recall wants you to try to solve the puzzle, which will form memories faster. Now, on the note of using your hands with physical cards, don't have to take my word for it. Lynn Kelly, author of MemoryCraft, of the memory code, she recently put it in a post on the Latrobe University website. Handwriting is the ultimate encryption device. Think of it this way. When you're making your own cards, making your own associations in your mind if you're not using cards, it's like packing your own parachute. And this gives you an additional feeling of tremendous accomplishment because you took the reins into your own hands. And yeah, you know, it's an old-fashioned metaphor, parachutes, and using paper index cards is old-fashioned, but that's what got me through university in combination with memory palaces, and I still use physical cards from time to time to this day, not always, because I prefer to exercise my mind purely with my mind, and I use a physical journal to test. I write out phrases like nihil minus est to see if I've actually gotten it all. And, you know, maybe I get stuck sometime and it's like, ominous occupati, well, I remember it now, quam weberi, but let's say I didn't, I'll just write out what I did remember and check it against the record later and fix it. This is for Latin, this is for Mandarin, it's for Sanskrit, it's for anything I want to memorize. It's a manual process where the hand builds memory and the relegation of the creative repetition is relegated to me not to a machine. Now, why is it so seductive to relegate recall to algorithms in softwares like Anki? Well, it's because you don't have to think. But there's a very simple way to think about spaced repetition that allows you to do it manually so you don't really have to think that much about it. And I never would have discovered the special orders that I use within memory palaces if I hadn't read hair Dr. Professor Herman Ebbinghaus. In 1885, Ebbinghaus released a study called Überdeskedeschnis, or in English, Memory, a Contribution to Experimental Psychology. In this book and other works, Ebbinghaus gives us a very special scientific examination of just how many times you need to voluntarily repeat information before it sticks. Now, there are no magic numbers here, but his interesting research is worth looking at to keep things brief and simple. Ebbinghaus memorized over 2,000 nonsense syllables and worked out how much time it took him to forget them. Now, there's an online program you can use to try and memorize some of these words yourself, which coincidentally is hosted by the University of Saarland in Germany, where I used to teach film studies quite some time ago before I started teaching memory techniques. The same place where I used to stun the students in my lecture halls and seminars by rapidly memorizing the names of everyone in those rooms and Horsals, as they're called in Germany, the lecture halls. Yet I was completely unaware that they had placed online Testung, their Gedeschnis Spanner, and that was been there even before I started teaching there. Coincidence? I don't know. But if you've seen part four of the New Art of Memory series, maybe it's chaos, maybe not. I don't know. Anyway, Ebbinghaus, the way he put it is that retention has a number, and this number can be increased by defeating what is now called the forgetting curve. So how long you retain things, that number can be improved. And Ebbinghaus first described this effect again in 1885. You can still, to this day, read articles from scientists working on how to optimize how often we repeat information and reduce that amount of repetition. Because it's not for the sake of repeating information, even though we do need repetition to learn. We want to increase the pleasure in the repetition so that we can maximize the long-term retention and have knowledge, ideally crystallized knowledge that becomes self-reinforcing and supports fluid intelligence, our ability to act as quickly as possible based on wisdom. So I don't just memorize these phrases from Seneca just for fun. I also do it because 
by having it deeply crystallized, it becomes fluid intelligence where I can remind myself, hey, you're getting busy about the stuff of life that is not particularly important. Let's turn our attention to the stuff that is. And for that reason, I've memorized dozens and dozens of lines of Sanskrit poetry that focus on the nature of reality and the irreal nature of thoughts and how thoughts are not particularly real. And I have reduced the amount of repetition needed to get it into long-term memory so that I can just simply repeat it to give myself wisdom as a means of guiding myself through the trials and tribulations of life. And fortunately, many people have done the same after they read my book, The Victorious Mind. Okay, so as Ebbinghaus tracked his rate of forgetting, certain principles emerged that enabled him to remember information for longer periods of time, while at the same time reducing the required amount of exposure needed to retain the information in the first place. Now, there's a quirk that we need to consider in Ebbinghaus's N equals one research. Again, he memorized what are called sinlose sylban, or nonsense words. And again, you can practice with the online software based on his work. But when I memorize nonsense in my own experiments, it's usually not his made up words. I like to memorize nonsense like the ursonata. You know, if only in part, and I've only memorized part of it, it's something like fumsvava tetse oomph packet. Like, it just doesn't make any sense. <laughs> but that's the point. It's just sound poetry. But you can also practice by memorizing phrases in languages that you don't know, and it will be nonsense until you understand the meaning. So you could practice, for example, with this phrase in Latin from Seneca, nihil minus est, omnes occupati quam viveri. Hmm, so beautiful to hold in memory. Now, to stress this point, I minimize the amount of repetition needed using memory palaces and active recall and using some of the patterns that Ebbinghaus worked on. But I just want to make that point. He worked on nonsense, on babble, and it's good exercise for you to do this as a way of revisiting that childlike sense of play. And Nemesai knows that we could all use more play. So to memorize a phrase like the one from Seneca that I'm giving, to reduce the amount of repetition, I use the patterns that I discovered in Ebbinghaus. So what are these repetition rules? I have a video where I go deeper into repetition rules, but in the spaced space of a memory palace and spaced over time, in order to get these phrases so that you can roll them off your tongue like it's 1999 and Prince is still rocking, you use images like Prince, for example. Prima S sapentia, Prince. You know, he's just doing something with ma, the Chinese symbol for horse, for example. You know, you can integrate these kinds of images and this helps you recall it quicker, faster, more directly. And there are no perfect images. So often people get hung up and they say, well, it just doesn't fit exactly. It's never going to fit exactly or very, very rarely. But what you want to do is get used to just assigning the best possible images and practice doing so until it becomes part of your procedural memory so that you can use the patterns that Ebbinghaus discussed and found. So what is this? How does spaced repetition learning turn your brain into a powerful memory device? Well, as Ebbinghaus and many other scientists since him have shown, looking at information you need to learn coupled with spaced retrieval practice over time and when you're using the memory palace technique over space that has been segmented in a particular way, this works to form neural connections in the brain faster and it does it that much more faster when you have this principle of active recall in the mix. Now scientists think that the majority of the bonds in your brain form while you're sleeping, a process known as memory consolidation. But the memory hacks that we're using with memory techniques, we're going to do this while we're awake. So it is not bad advice to study before you go to sleep to get a bit of this memory consolidation technique, but it's not really a technique, it's just you know a timing thing. But this can be different depending on your age. So if you're my age, you're not necessarily going to get the same benefit as you might when you're younger. And when you're younger, if you force yourself to get up with an alarm clock early, 
you may interrupt the memory consolidation effect. So studying before you go to bed may have no effect at all, even though it should. So learning consolidation through sleep is not a magic bullet. Don't rely on it. Yes, you want to maximize for it. You want to optimize for it, but you have so many other things to consider. Are you able to sleep in, for example, if you're younger? If you're older, are you going to get an effect at all? I don't rely on my age. I don't rely on how much I sleep. I rely on the magnetic memory method. So we want to look at the science, but we don't want to measure ourselves against it. Instead, we need to be like Ebbinghaus himself and act like test subjects in the laboratory of our own mind. I cannot stress the gift he gave the world by doing that himself and documenting it and sharing it enough. This is a tremendous gift because it should not just be that you look at the data, but that you imitate him and become a serious student of your own memory yourself, a serious scientist of your own memory. Every memory master has to do this. And this is a very, very important point that I'll be stressing for the rest of my life and career. Doing the art of memory and doing so consistently is the definition of memory mastery. No doing, no mastery. This is Yoda 101. There is no try. Now, many people have worked out different repetition and retrieval patterns to try to optimize how the brain learns. Some people find that randomness works best and some people like to relegate it to softwares like Anki. Either way, all the studies show that regular intervals provide much faster results provided that you maximize primacy effect and recency effect through what is called serial positioning effect. How exactly do you bring primacy and recency to each and every station in a memory palace with spaced repetition so you're harnessing the serial positioning effect? Well, let's have a look at this memory palace, which has a bunch of Sanskrit in it. It has my TEDx talk in it and some other things. Basically, when I encode something in the memory palace, I go forward and I travel the memory palace all the way to the end, but I also go backwards. I travel everything in it in reverse order. And I start at the middle of the memory palace for a pass and I go to the beginning backwards. And then I start at the middle again and go to the end. And then here's where the real speed starts to begin. I go from station one to three to five to seven and then all the way up to the end, I go backwards on the numbers. So if I'm at 10, I go from 10 to eight to six to four to two. And that gives maximum spaced repetition effects that absolutely crush it into long-term memory so quickly. And these phrases that I share with you in Latin, it's the same thing. I actually skip the words based on where they are in the memory palaces in order to speed up absorption into long-term memory with a reduced amount of repetition. It is the closest thing to real magic that exists. Now, who are these people who have worked on the different ways of spacing the amount of time between exposure and recall that you can experiment with yourself? Well, we've covered many of them in our new Art of Memory series already. In part one, Aristotle shared with you his teaching that if you enter into the middle of the alphabet in a memory palace structured around the alphabet, you can move in different patterns. This is in his book, De Memoria. Hugh of St. Victor, in part two of the new Art of Memory, he used his ancient version of a cash register and the imaginary versions of Noah's Ark to navigate memorized information by following different patterns. And I share some of that in that video. Giordano Bruno in part four on the chaos memory palace of Giordano Bruno. He's perhaps the greatest memory master of all time who taught us to use multiple memory palaces, to use memory wheels, which we'll be discussing in a few moments, all of which are going to have some sort of recall rehearsal pattern in order to maximize active recall that reduces any form of rote and eliminates rote entirely so that you're actually just asking what happened in this memory palace and cause it to replay in a way that triggers the information that you're looking for, the target. How did the ancient people know what to do long before Ebbinghaus came along to capture all of this in scientific terminology? Well, my best guess is all these people, Aristotle, Hugh of St. Victor, Giordano Bruno, they're philosophers. Who else is known better than a philosopher to put in their reps at a strategically spaced interval? They're asking questions continually. What is the nature of the universe? What is the nature of numbers? There's three rocks over there. Is the concept of three 
in the rocks themselves? Or is there a concept of three somewhere in the heavens and we with our minds are tying together through observation three rocks in the world and the concept of three somewhere in heaven? Well, philosophers keep doing this again and again and again, and in order to remember their previous conclusions about the nature of information, they start cooking up different ways of doing this. And they also come up with terminology. They need to remember their terminology, like, for example, the difference between extension and intention. And then to manage that, they're going to need to memorize it. They don't have Anki. They don't have anything like the Settlecastin or the Leitner system or any of these things that have evolved in order to maximize spaced repetition through the recording of information onto index cards or flash cards that you can move around in boxes. So they have to be scientists of consciousness and how information appears in consciousness. Now, I don't think any scientist knows why exactly spacing out our learning periods work, but you as a philosopher can already improve your memory by doing the work of philosophy, asking questions repeatedly, and that's what a memory palace can help you do in a creative way. I have a memory palace. What did I put in the memory palace? What was happening there? Oh, right, my friend Nikita, he's pressing minus on a calculator. Nihil minus est. Now, what about this guy, Giordano Bruno, and his memory wheels? Well, to the best of my knowledge, the memory wheels actually come from a guy named Ramon Lull. So, if you'd like to learn more about Ramon Lull and the origin of the memory wheels, I know a fair little bit about it. So, let me know loud and clear in the comments and be subscribed with notifications spinning like a memory wheel if you would like to see a full study of Ramon Lull and the memory wheels as I continue rolling out the new Art of Memory series. Now, these wheels are not necessarily memory palaces as such, though they certainly can be used that way. The way you can use them also offers spaced repetition effects, and they can serve as a form of imaginary or conceptual memory palace if you want to use them in that way. So the idea is generally in a memory wheel that each letter is a station in a circular memory palace that just exists in your mind. Or you could make a paper memory wheel that you hold in your hands and rotate in your hands. Either way, the point is that each letter in a memory wheel compresses a larger thought or a mental process. So if you were to have multiple wheels operating together, you could perform what has been called ars combinatoria or the art of combination which helps you think critically or generate unique mnemonic images that you can then transport into standard memory palaces. So let's imagine a very simple memory wheel where you would have, let's say, two circles to help you with the contemplation of how to behave as a learner. So you come to a great memory master like Bruno and you tell him you have an issue with procrastination. So Bruno looks around in his mind for the student problem memory wheel, and he rolls to the outer wheel P. And from that position on the wheel, our great memory master unfolds the letter P in the form of a memory palace, where he has memorized all the problems related to procrastination. And he can then give you a speech. Well, you're suffering from procrastination because it makes you feel badly about yourself. And then the great memory master rolls the inner wheel to the letters containing the solutions for procrastination, which may be Y for Yoda, do or do not, there is no try. And those letters unfold the information related to the solutions that have been stored in a memory palace. It's the art of combination, combining a problem with a series of solutions. And, you know, I talked about in the Chaos Memory Palace of Giordano Bruno, why he would get so frustrated with his students. Because no matter how cleverly he may have used memory wheels to give them the best advice on the planet, they wouldn't necessarily take action. So he had to keep prompting them, make your own, make your own, make your own, because getting advice from others is not necessarily going to change anything. You change yourself by doing. Now, why are these wheels helping create a spaced repetition effect? Well, because of the way you visit them, both in space and time. You would travel these wheels mentally in different directions, and you would be called upon to remember what the different letters of the alphabet stood for, and as you think, what does P stand for? You're getting yourself 
to repeat. And because you have a memory palace involved, P for procrastination, maybe you have Prince drinking cranberry juice in that particular memory palace to help trigger this information. So now it's creative repetition. And we know Bruno talks about how he used different statues, different mythological figures to help him encode the information he wanted to remember and unfold it in that way. And the more the memory master works with the wheels, the more spaced repetition deeply grinds the information into long-term memory, and eventually the wheels and any and all associated memory palaces fall away. This is because the spaced repetition process, both in time and space, gives you long-term memory. And we're talking about random access memory, where you can just recall what you need to recall without having to go to the memory palace. So the problem here is that referring to information in this way establishes memory in the mind of the memory master. And that means you have to become a memory master yourself in order to benefit from spatial representations so that you can spatially repeat over time and throughout the space of a memory palace. So what are you going to do? Well, now that you've got the big picture overview, let's talk about how to choose the right spaced repetition schedule for you, either with memory wheels or traditional memory palaces, or even with flashcards or even with Anki. The first step is to choose how you're going to engage in spaced repetition learning. You can do it by manually setting review times in your calendar, you can do it by having flashcards and leaving them where you see them, where you just kind of happen to see them and pick them up as a personal discipline. You can use a spaced repetition software that will bing, 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 remind you. Not my favorite thing to do, but you know, that it's your adventure. You can use a Leitner box or a Settelkasten system where you literally have cards arranged in boxes that helps you remember your review system. Now, you've got to be careful here because that gets into rote learning very, very quickly. If you don't have cards that have puzzles on them that you have to solve, you're not using creative repetition. You're not using active recall. You're just f exposing yourself to the information again, which is going to slow down the formation of memory. The ultimate, the one that I'm definitely, definitely biased towards because I get such a benefit from it, and I've seen so many people benefit from it, is using a memory palace system manually, voluntarily. And this is very, very important. No matter what you choose though, here are some suggested schedules. So the first schedule would be some sort of irregular spacing. So when you're coming back to learning the material, you can space out your exposure and retrieval in irregular doses. In other words, you're randomly choosing to review material on an irregular pattern, like after one day, after three days, after two days, after seven days, after five days, after one day, etc. The second scheduling pattern you could try is regular spacing. So many studies have found, as I mentioned before, that regular rehearsal patterns work better. Dominic O'Brien, creator of the Dominic system for memorizing numbers, sometimes called Hotel Dominic, he teaches what he calls the rule of five. So the rule of five looks like this. Once a day of recall for five days, once a week for five weeks, once a month for five months. There's nothing magic about the number five. You could easily change it to two or seven. The point is that the intervals are regular instead of irregular. Now, I, I kind of like the rule of five, but I've personally modified the approach for my own learning projects, and I'm going to tell you very, very straight. I don't have any magic numbers in my life. I repeat it as many times as it takes to get it into long-term memory, and that number of repetitions goes down relative to how well I'm using the memory palace, how magnetic my images are, and how I'm feeling. What's my health like? What's my diet like? What's my sleep like? And I can sometimes memorize things once and remember them, but other times I have to give a little bit more repetition and there is no magic number. There is no way to know because information is unequal. If we take a phrase like omnium expedendorum prima es sapentia in qua perfecti boni forma consistit, the word expedendorum, it needed more attention than other words. And, you know, these phrases, 
Sometimes I hit them, sometimes I don't, and I have to think, what's happening here? So, you know, I may be just a new phrase that I've memorized, uh, like this one uh, from Seneca, nihil minus est. You know, I might, oh, what was it? Was it ominous? Was it ominum? Was it omina? Whatever it is, you know, I may get caught on that and I have to go back and correct it. Is that a big deal? No, because each mistake, when they appear, is an opportunity to learn. What could have I done in that memory palace to hit it faster, harder, more accurately? You train yourself to engage in this voluntarily, without reminders from machines, because you are being and working towards and assuming the real art of memory, the new art of memory. And again, I carry a journal everywhere because I don't want to rest on my laurels. I want accuracy. Accuracy comes from testing. So I sit down, I use, I sit on this. Actually sitting on this in my back pocket reminds me of my commitment to practicing my memory. Then I pull it out and I test whatever it is that I have memorized. Call me old fashioned, but sitting on that journal and reminding myself to test my memory is so much more pleasant than bing, ding, ding on a device. And it gives me the benefits of handwriting, which again, handwriting is the ultimate encryption device for forming memories faster, especially when you're producing through active recall from a memory palace. Okay, so this is very, very exciting stuff. All you need to do is absolutely commit to coming up with some sort of schedule for yourself. And the point is always to make this fast, fun, and furious by choosing to memorize information that improves your life. Or if you're a doctor or a lawyer, the information that moves you forward in your career. If you're a student, the information that is most likely to be on the exam. Not every detail under the sun, the most likely details that you're going to need. And of course, the magnetic memory method is for that professional level individual who is devoted to getting ahead in the career that you have chosen for yourself so you can become the architect of your dreams. Hey, Anthony, just wanted to say thank you so much for taking the time to, to create that video and send it along. Wow, it's not every day that you come across somebody who's both a content creator and who's willing to, uh, uh, to take the time to you know, respond to, to people's questions. So I, I really appreciate it. Um, you know, I've been doing these, some of these techniques for years. It's sort of what got me through law school and um, the bar exam and the master's program and then the doctoral coursework. Uh, but one of the things that really stood out to me was the fact that you've really done your homework. That's pretty impressive. I mean, you, you have dug deep in a lot of these different areas and uh, super impressive, all the content that you provide. So I felt like I, I wanted to give, you know, to, to pay that money forward uh, for the work that you've done. So anyway, just wanted to take a minute and say thank you so much. Great work and uh, keep, up the, keep up the awesome work. Now we've talked about regular scheduling. We've talked about irregular scheduling. Now we can talk about blended. So you don't have to just have irregular and regular spacing. You can combine the two for maximum effect. Now, often this blending of the two will happen naturally. So, for example, if you're learning a language and you're using graded readers, you're going to naturally receive an additional amount of exposure with words that regularly appear again and again and again, like pronouns. And then you're going to have words that appear less frequently, irregularly. And a similar effect will happen when you're reading a book in any language. If you're studying economics, certain concepts are going to come up regularly and other ones are going to come up less regularly. And you can put things in your favor by putting a little bit more emphasis on using active recall to get those less common concepts and words and terms into long-term memory by just putting a little bit more regular exposure on them. And, you know, the best repetition schedule is really never one or the other, but both. Now, of course, there is the Magnetic Mary Method schedule. And for more on that, make sure to visit magneticmerrymethod.com, get the free course, or just dive into the Magnetic Mary Method Masterclass. Because once you're settled on how you're going to use spaced repetition as a learning method, you've decided on the scheduling, now you can optimize the entire process. And many people, they make a huge mistake. They keep 
simply exposing themselves over and over and over again to information without making that change, to elaborating each and every word that they want to memorize, and then recalling the elaboration in order to help form the memories. So how can you start to make the change? Just start elaborating while learning. Try to avoid simply reading information. Interact with it using mnemonic imagery. So if you're learning a new phrase or a word like brachial plexus, imagine stomping on the brakes. And those brakes are made out of plexiglass so that you have this idea of brachial plexus in the imagery. The imagery sounds like the term that you want to start getting into memory. You don't even have to put it in a memory palace to start doing this, although I recommend that you do. This process is called elaborative rehearsal. It makes information much stickier, much faster. And if you feel like you're not really able to produce these kinds of associations, that's what the Magnetic Memory Method Masterclass is all about. It has exercises that will give you dexterity and speed, the kind that I myself have developed, and anybody can do it if you follow these processes. They'll develop your procedural memory in the same way that you can just hop on a bike after you haven't ridden over the winter and you still are able to ride a bike. You can learn these processes, and even if you don't use memory techniques for a while, you'll be really sharp at coming up with absolute masterful associations that are based correctly on these kinds of associations for brachial plexus, for example. Are those the best possible ones? Well, I might think maybe it's Brad Pitt putting the brakes on, right? Because brachial, brake, but Brad also has that BR. So that's one step further into more magnetic elaborative rehearsal. These mnemonic devices are so powerful. Now, You've chosen to start doing this while you're reading, while you're listening to podcasts, while you're watching videos, and then you just put that information into memory palaces and you let a little bit of time pass. This part is simple. You don't really have to do anything at all. You go out, have fun with your friends, you play games, you check out some music, watch a movie, whatever. And then you maybe get some sleep to help form your memories faster. If you are in the age group that gets a benefit from sleep consolidation in memory formation, and you start to recall your elaborations first. So there's a couple of errors that I see a lot of people make. What they do is instead of causing their mind to recall the information, they cheat. They look at the information or they even have the information available to look at. No, no, don't do this have a journal or some kind of piece of paper, some kind of notebook where there is no access to the target information. Then what you do is you bring it to mind, then write it down. This helps optimize the memory formation and get you much closer to both crystallized knowledge and that fluid knowledge where you can start to just have these phrases or the knowledge roll off your tongue. Go from memory palace to the images in the memory palace into your mind with the target information, then write it out. This is a very, very simple process. And you can avoid making all kinds of errors by just simply following it as a discipline. Don't cheat. Don't look at your flashcard answers. Don't even have answers on the flashcard in the first place. This is the challenge of active recall. This is what helps form memories faster. Even if you make mistakes, which you inevitably will, those are opportunities to think about what went wrong and how to fix the issue. And you know, it's not about right or wrong. We have to use the word wrong because there, a wrong answer is a wrong answer. Let's call a spade a spade. You don't have to beat yourself up about it. It's an opportunity to think about your practice as a learner using elaboration. So forgive me if I'm flogging the horse again, pen, paper, writing on digital has been shown to be less effective than actually using pen and paper. Now, you have to test that for yourself. I know I'm an old-fashioned person. I know that I like to look at the science and say, look, this is what the science says. But I have tested this myself. I just don't get a benefit from digital as much as I get it from analog, all right? And now, the next thing is, is just to add as many repetition opportunities as you can. So, you know, I, I just take every opportunity to repeat the stuff that I'm memorizing in order to form the memory through my hands, through writing, through my mouth, by saying what I'm memorizing, talking about what I'm memorizing. And you can seek out additional books to read to get some natural spaced repetition by coming up with those ideas again and again and again. Listen to podcasts where they talk about those topics. Watch additional video 
tutorials related to that topic, and then translate it into your own words by writing summaries. Do this as much as you can. You don't have to build an elaborate memory blog like I have with MagneticMemoryMethod.com, but that has helped me remember the information about memory because I get that additional layer of creative repetition because I'm summarizing for you what I have learned. You don't have to have a blog like that. You can leave comments on videos. You can summarize the videos themselves. And yeah, some people are gonna be like, hey, I can use ChatGPT now to summarize this video for me. Great, but who are you robbing when you do that as opposed to being the text generator yourself? That's a form of getting in spaced repetition that is very powerful. So make use of your own fingers and get involved in the discussion, in the dialogue. Ask questions and provide your own answers. Summarize. And then of course you can take test exams. No matter what you're learning, you can find sample exams or you can come up with your own. Self-testing is a fantastic form of spaced repetition that gives you rapid feedback. And you can manually schedule a bunch of tests for yourself, automate reminders, email yourself so that you don't forget to test yourself. Or you can just, like I say, have this in your back pocket. You sit on it. And it's a reminder, time to test what I've been memorizing. Okay, so those are some tips for you in terms of getting spaced repetition into your life regularly. And it is absolutely fantastic to be able to form memories as quickly as possible. And you know, I've made some jokes about Yoda and procrastination and do or do not, there is no try. Well, Yoda is correct. The art of memory is an art. And it really is a do or do not activity. But there's another truth. We're always repeatedly encountering different kinds of information that we already know. And spaced repetition studying simply optimizes the process by bringing strategy to the game so that we can then, instead of having to go, well, do I understand this? Do I remember this? again and again and again, we just get it understood, we get it memorized, and then we move on to the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. In order to do that, scheduling is really, really powerful. It leads to compounding effects because the more you know, the more you can know, the more connections and hooks you have in your mind. So schedule your learning, schedule your recall, and bring a decent amount of regularity to the process, but also a decent amount of irregularity to the process using the specific steps that we talked about today. And if you are getting less results than you would like, always analyze, am I using magnetic imagery? Am I using well-formed memory palaces? Am I challenging myself by experimenting with different forms of spatial repetition using things like memory wheels? This will stretch your brain, and that's a good thing. How are you gonna grow new brain cells? How are you going to experience neurogenesis if you don't stretch? It's the same thing with doing push-ups or lifting weights. You need to take on a little bit more than you can handle to challenge those muscles so they can grow. And before you know it, you're gonna feel like you've been a spaced repetition pro forever, and you'll do like I do. Take on new learning challenges that challenge you even more. And you can do this for life and keep going. More is more and more is more still. And you can fuse yourself together with the great memory tradition. It's a tradition because you get to join people like Aristotle, Hugh of St. Victor, Ebbinghaus, and myself. And spaced repetition also has so many applications in the deliberate practice that we use for music, for choreography, in dance or martial arts. Wherever there is learning, there is space for highly optimized spaced repetition. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you want more information about the actual science of active recall, please go ahead, stick around, and watch my video on active recall next. And of course, if you're missing the first parts of the New Art of Memory series, start with Aristotle's nuclear alphabet. Go through the imaginary memory palace method of Hugh of St. Victor. Watch the chaos memory palace of Giordano Bruno. Whatever you do, you want to remember the things that I say, what other people say in their books and their videos and their podcasts. Make sure you're optimizing that information with spaced repetition, ideally in memory palaces, using magnetic imagery. 
Thank you again, and until we have a chance to speak again, come visit me at MagneticMaryMethod.com and keep yourself magnetic.